So, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I, I both like and hate following Tom Hama. You know, he's, it's difficult to follow him because he's so good. But I like following him because he's just given you this amazing amount of data and this amazing amount of knowledge about the real benefits of trade. And he's right. And not only is he right, it's not that hard to get that he's right. And yet, when I go back to kind of the theme I talked about yesterday, we're losing. I mean, the world is shifting away from free trade. You see it in, in the United States, you see it in dramatic fashion in the United States. And the response in China has not been, I wish, imagine a response like this from China. Um, you know, imagine if China had said to, the, to Trump, you know, they said, you want to screw Americans by raising tariffs? Go ahead. We're not going to screw Chinese by raising our tariffs in response to that. We're going to actually lower tariffs in response to your raising. But no, the Chinese are playing the game. We're going to screw, you know, you shoot yourself in the knee, in the foot, we're going to shoot ourselves in the knee. Okay, I'll shoot myself in the stomach. So, it, you know, it, it, it's, 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 every one of these countries is adopting these notions about trade. We're not seeing, and we're not seeing a vocal opposition. Like, it, 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 you're not seeing rally calls. Even the Wall Street Journal kind of is hedging its support for free trade. It used to be real adamant about this issue of free trade. And now they tend to be hedging on their editorial page. Time and time again, we're seeing a deterioration in our basic understanding of these economic principles, our basic support. I think the understanding is still there, or not there. But our basic support for these economic principles. I mean, much of... Brexit and much of the challenges that are happening in the European Union, which I can somewhat understand why you would want to get away from Brussels. I mean, Brussels is an awful entity. But some of the motivation for Brexit, some of the motivation, not all of it, some of the motivation for Brexit was, yeah, this free trade stuff, and yeah, this free immigration stuff, and yeah, this free flow of capital stuff, it's too much. We don't want it. It's not just about sovereignty. It's not just about the over-regulation of Brussels. I wish it was. But indeed, the British government has repeatedly said that after Brexit, no matter what, how Brexit happens, they're going to adopt all the regulations that Brussels had imposed on them. Just they're going to vote on it themselves. So again, self-inflicted pain is better than pain inflicted by, I guess, people outside. The world is retreating from the ideas of free trade, of free movement, of capital, labor, goods, and its own, and it's causing itself economic harm. Economic harm that almost all economists recognize, and yet they're not willing to stand up and defend the system. And the question we have to keep asking ourselves is what are we missing in our communication? What are we missing about the motivations of people? Is it economic knowledge? And it certainly is to a large extent. People out there are ignorant. They just don't get it. They just don't get a competitive advantage. You know, I, I hate to say it's difficult, but yeah, it's not intuitive. You don't just get it. You have to go through the numbers a little bit. You have to have it presented. But you know, every econ 101 class, everyone, high school, college, does have competitive advantage. And it has been doing it for 250 years. You'd think that after 250 years, this would have sunk in in the cultural whatever zeitgeist, right? I mean, certainly, we all do algebra. Algebra is harder than comparative advantage, and nobody is challenging algebra. So why are they challenging in economics basic math, basic principles that work? Now, there's complexity. Part of truly is complex. You know, you hear this story, and I think Tom, Tom related to it. You know, it's Chinese subsidized. So it's not fair. As if that impacts the fact that I'm getting a cheap good and the huge benefit of that cheap good, the 40 to 1. Although, you know, the 40 to 1, what if it was flipped? Hmm. What if I was protecting 40 at the expense of 1? We would still be against it. It would still be bad politics, economics, individual rights. It would still be bad policy. <clears throat> So why? 
what is it? And, and again, I want to I want to return to something I said yesterday. And, and you can see there's so much of the rhetoric that's going on in the world out there. I'm going to feed off of what Tom talked about and, and, and relate this to the issue of trade. We are becoming, the world is turning back to collectivism. The world is turning back to tribalism. We are returning to a period in which we see ourselves not as individuals, but as members of a group. And the group identity has become what is most important. I think it's because of a decline in the respect for the individual mind, a decline in the respect for individual sovereignty, individual rights, this idea of individualism is under attack constantly. The whole way in which we talk about trade is a reflection of this. You know, America runs a trade deficit with China. Really? Does America trade? When has America ever traded? <laughs> Who the hell is America anyway? I know I trade with some Chinese guy somewhere, usually through Walmart or Best Buy or Apple or something. But America didn't trade. No. An individual trades yeah. with an individual on the other side. Why is it any of the government's business or your business? Who I buy my stuff from? My stuff, not your stuff, not American stuff. And if I want to trade with somebody in Bangladesh or somebody in Ohio or somebody in Mongolia, why is it anybody's business? My neighbor's business? No. My collective neighbor's business? No. My American country's business? What the hell is that? And my government's business? What? I haven't violated anybody's rights. I haven't shot anybody on the way. I haven't stolen anything from anybody. I haven't committed a crime. I bought something from somebody who lives in another country. Now, you could make an argument that if the person who lives in another country is an enemy, they're out to kill us. They're not supporting an enemy. Okay, but China's not an enemy. And, and by the way, one of the reasons Donald Trump has to designate these countries as enemy countries is to make this case of supporting the enemy by trading with them. But none of these countries are enemy. Not Canada, not Mexico, not even China. Not unless we make them one. And we're, we're, we're well on the way, I think, to creating enemies more than we are solving anything. But individuals trade, not countries. Countries don't trade. Countries don't. Countries are an abstraction. It's a, it's a political convenience, right? We've got certain borders. These are the laws. These are the rules in these borders. There's a different border set over here with different laws in this set. But that country doesn't trade. Countries don't have trade deficits. I, as an individual, have lots of trade deficits. They really piss me off, you know? I go to the grocery store every day. I leave my cash there. I get stuff. And they've never hired me to give a talk. <laughs> I want my money back. I mean, I want, it, I, want, I want trade balance between myself and the grocery store. It's just wrong. Right? But no, I leave my cash there. I get the goods. And nobody worries about that trade deficit. But individuals have lots of trade deficits. We don't care. Because the money circulates back and we can we, we prefer to have the goods than the cash. How do we know we prefer to have the goods than the cash? Yeah, I engage in a trade. I exhibited my preference for goods over cash. Americans prefer to have Chinese goods than the cash. Why is it anybody's business? But our framework, everything we talk about, is become collectivized. This is bad for America. You know, American jobs. Is there such a thing as American jobs? What does that even mean? I mean, I have a job. You have a job. We happen to be Americans. But why is my job related to your job? It's not. I mean, this is part of the problem of, of uh, talking about aggregate statistics and emphasizing aggregate statistics and constantly obsessing about GDP and unemployment and these aggregates that don't mean that much. You know, the, the, uh, I was just reading on the, on the way, on the flight here, somebody sent me an email, a quote from, uh, about Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, for decades, the government collected no aggregate statistics. They said, we don't care. We're here to protect property rights, to allow for contracts, and to create an environment 
that is that makes economic activity feasible, and that's it. We, you know, unemployment. You know, it's GDP. What does it mean? And they collected no statistics. And at one some point in time, there was pressure on them. And uh, the legislature in Hong Kong wanted to pass a new law that set up a statistics office that started collecting GDP numbers and all these aggregate statistics. And the governor of Hong Kong, to his credit, said, no, we don't need those statistics. They don't impact what we have to do one iota. Our job is not to manage an economy. Our job is not to greatly increase GDP. Our job is not to lower unemployment. Our job is to protect property and contracts and leave you alone to do your thing economically. And he refused to have it. I don't know when statistics were started collected in Hong Kong, but I wouldn't be surprised if you could see a direct correlation between that point and a slow deterioration in economic freedom in Hong Kong. One of the things he said is, once you collect the statistic, we'll start targeting economic policy for the statistic, not towards freedom, but towards the statistic towards maximizing GDP or minimizing this or that. You can see right now in the United States, what should the Fed do? Should it lower interest rates because job creation is lower? Should it raise interest rates because they've been printing money like crazy for 10 years? What, what do you do? Well, as I think we know, there is no right answer to that. There is no right answer to the questions of central planning. There is no right answer to the questions of these aggregate statistics. The best thing the Federal Reserve could do is dismantle itself. Right? And return the creation of money and the determination of interest rates to where they belong, to individuals in the marketplace, to supply and demand. But that's inconceivable because America has to have a central bank. As we move towards more and more tribalism, more and more collectivism, you will see more trade conflicts, you will see more conflicts around immigration, you will see more centralized planning. If we're all one just group, if we're not individuals, then how do you make decisions as a group? How do you make decisions as a group? How does the tribe make decisions? We're not supposed to do it as individuals because we as individuals don't count. What matters is the group. How do you make decisions? You can vote. But voting is not very efficient. It's much more efficient to do what? What's the most efficient way a group can make decisions? Yeah, nominate a leader. Let's pick a leader. He'll make decisions for us in any way. One of the reasons we chose the group is because we don't trust our own mind as individuals. We don't trust our own reasoning. We don't trust our own ability to make decisions. We need somebody to be able to commune with the spirits to tell us what's good for the group. I mean, think about it. Why, why in, in communism do you need a dictator? Well, because you've got the proletariat, and we're supposed to do everything for the good of the proletariat. But who the hell knows what's good for the proletariat? I don't know what's good for the proletariat. You need somebody to be able to commune with the spirit of the proletariat to be able to tell us what's good for the proletariat. And what about the Aryan race? Anybody know what's good for the Aryan race? How many Jews we need to kill in order to get the Aryan race really psyched up? No, nobody knows what's good for the Aryan race. Because the fact is, the reality is, there's no such thing as good for the Aryan race. There's no such thing as good for the proletariat. There's no such thing as the good for the group. That's true. Good can only apply to the individual. Once you establish the standard as the good for the group, then we need a leader to figure out what that is, and we need to obey his commandments and follow his path. A moral state a moral government, it can only be a government that protects the individual's ability to make decisions about the individual's own good. There is no good above that. So the only role of government is to protect our rights, our freedoms, to leave us alone, rather than to sacrifice us for some greater good. And this is politicians left and right, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They all preach to us what? The greater good. The public interest. 
the common good. Dictators or democratically elected leaders doesn't matter. We as individuals do not count. What counts is the collective. Fill in the blank what that collective is going to be. <clears throat> whether it's the state, whether it's the politician, whether it's the race, whether it's whatever. Tribe you belong to, or we all belong to these days. And in America, the tribes are getting, you know, very... And you can see it on the left, right? Identity politics. Anybody heard of the intersectionality? You, heard of, you haven't heard of intersectionality? It's really popular in American, on American campuses. It's this whole doctrine that basically ranks people based on how oppressed they are. Yeah, so, so uh, you know, I'm like, I'm not one of the worst oppressors, according to intersectionality, even though I'm white and male. That's the worst, right? Because I'm Jewish, so that, that gives me a little bit of bonus credits. Because I've been oppressed in my history, as if I was oppressed because my ancestors were oppressed. Again, collectivism, right? You know, you have to be, I don't know, I think it's transgender black, I can't remember the groupings to make you the most, but everybody's, everybody has a box now. Everybody belongs to a particular box, to a particular tribe, and you rank based on how oppressive pressed you are. You don't belong, you're not an individual, you're not who you are, you're not your values, you're your specific tribe's values. And you're seeing a backlash from the right. We're saying the right is basically saying, you want to play identity politics? We can do that. You know? Yeah, we're, we're actually still the majority in the US. So we're white. Or we're white males. Or we're white this. We can do that as well. And you're seeing a growth in this tribalistic mentality, both left and right. All the idea of collectivism. What is the fundamental idea of tribalism and collectivism? The group is more important than the individual. It's okay to sacrifice the individual for the group. And then we can talk about the hierarchy of the different groups and who's more important than whom. But collectivism is destroying the world in which we live. Collectivism is blinding people to their own self-interest because they're not seeking their own self-interest. I know people who say, yeah, yeah, I'm better off by trading with China, but America, you know, America, we need to protect America. We need to protect the group now. Forget about me. More and more and more of this mentality. And the poorer and poorer we will get, and the less free we will get. It is collectivism that has to be fought. And it has to be fought today, both on the right and on the left. It has to be fought on every front, and it has to be fought in every dimension. And what is ultimately at the core of collectivism? What is that ultimately at the core of this grouping? Well, one, as I said, a disregard for reason, a disregard for our individual rational faculty, our, uh, a, 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 a view that says that we can't actually, as individuals, know reality. We need the safety of the group to help us discover the truth. But there's also a moral core to this idea of collectivism. And here I think it's particularly appealing to most people. We are taught from when we're very little that morality means the sacrifice, your sacrifice, to others. Augustine Comte, the French 19th century philosopher, said that morality is about your service to other people. That to be good means to devote your life to serving others. And the more you serve them, the more you sacrifice yourself for them, the better human being you actually are. And if, in serving others, it crosses your mind that you're going to enjoy it, that you're going to get some satisfaction from it, that you're going to be in some dimension better off for helping others, it doesn't count as morality. It's not moral anymore. The whole point of morality is to be selfless, to deny self. And he coined this term, he gave it a new name, he called it altruism. 
Now today we use altruism in a variety of different ways. But the first person to use it philosophically was August, was Kant. And he used it to define this idea that your selflessness, lack of self, was what made you a good person, what made you a moral person. Now, if I lack self, then of course I'm going to be part of a tribe. Because there's no I, there's only us. There's only we, Americans, white, gray, green, blue, whatever. Mongolians, Chinese. We're all just tribes. Individuals don't matter. Because self doesn't matter. And this idea, while not in its pure, you know, obviously calm sense of selflessness, that, that sense, you know, people reject that. Nobody actually wants to devote their entire lives, unless you're maybe Mother Teresa, to just other people and to suffer as a consequence. Nobody actually wants to do that. So we don't actually live by that code. But we still regard it. We still regard it as, you know, as right, as moral, as good. That's an ideal. We can't live it. Because, hey, we're just human. But that's the ideal. So we feel guilty when we don't live up to it. So many people feel guilty because they don't live up to it. It's not about how much help you provide other people. Morality, in our modern context, is not about helping others. Because it was about helping others. Who are the greatest beneficiaries of all of the history in terms of mankind? Who have benefited the poor more than anybody else? Charities? Foreign aid? Businessmen. Businessmen are the greatest beneficiaries of mankind has ever seen. They have brought more people out of poverty than anyone. Businessmen and the freedom raise the standard of living of everybody. <clears throat> They've helped others more than any other human being. And billionaires more than anybody else. How do you make a billion? What's the secret to making a billion dollars? We're talking dollars, not Mongolian currency, because <laughs> a billion is not that much. <laughs> or Korea, where they deal with seven-figure numbers constantly. I don't care how they do the math. <laughs> but how do you become a billionaire in dollars? How do you, how do you make a billion dollars? Give the people what they want. Well, okay, I mean, I'm giving the people what they want, and nobody pays me a billion. It's not enough to give the people what they want. Which people? How many people? What are you giving them? How do you become a billionaire? Come on, guys. I mean, somebody must know. Yeah. Create a lot more than a billion in value. Yeah. Create an enormous amount of value for whom? For lots of people. So if you look at billionaires, they usually touch the lives of hundreds of millions of people. And touch the lives means they trade with hundreds of millions of people. Which means they make the lives of hundreds of millions of people better. Because otherwise, we talked about trade mutually beneficial, right? If I sell you a product, your life is better, and my life is better. I mean, my favorite example here is, and, and I usually use this in my talk on inequality, but it's such a good example. J.K. Rollins, does anybody know J.K. Rollins? Do you read uh, uh, Harry Potter in Mongolia? Harry Potter? Yeah. Yeah? Uh, a lot of you, you read Harry Potter in Mongolia. You read Harry Potter? I don't see the Mongolians reacting, so <laughs> Yes? Harry Potter, these amazing books. I mean, I, I, I love them. I, I really enjoy them. But you know, Harry Potter is a real problem because Harry Potter has dramatically increased inequality in the world. You know, I, I figured I've spent three to four thousand dollars on Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. You know, there were seven books. Mm -hmm. I had to buy two because I had one for each of my sons. And then I bought an audio tape for me. And then there were all the movies. And then on top of that, there's like rides in Disneyland, yeah, music box, box, and stuff like that. Thousands of dollars I spent on Harry Potter. <laughs> I got thousands of dollars poor because of Harry Potter. And, and, and what happened to J.K. Rollins? The hoods of it, right? What happened to J.K. Rollins? <laughs> she became a billionaire. A billionaire. And I got poor. <laughs> now, you laugh, but this is exactly what PKD does and what all the inequality bumbo-jumbo economists do. They look at my bank account, 
and they see my bank account went down by several thousand dollars. And they look at J.K. Rowling's bank account and it went up by several thousand dollars. And they say, look, inequality's increased. Now, am I poor because I bought J.K. Rowling's books? Well, it depends how you measure poverty. If you measure it in dollar terms, I'm poor. I have several thousand dollars less. But what did I get for it? This amazing spiritual value. My life is richer. My life is better off for having traded with J.K. Rawls. Just having two sons that read, read in their generation, they read a book, that's cool, right? And enjoyed it. And enjoyed it. And I enjoyed it. And we got to talk about it. I mean, that's worth, I don't know, millions of dollars probably. The joy you get out of an experience like that. So I'm better off. J.K. Rawls is better off. But inequality increased. So how do you become a billionaire? J.K. Rawls' case. You spiritually enhance the lives of millions, hundreds of millions of people who bought her books. Any billionaire, in a free market at least, or in a semi-free market, is a billionaire because he's made the world a better place for hundreds of millions of people. And yet, how much moral credit, how much moral credit, morality, ethics, do we give billionaires? Zero. Zero. You're being generous. Zero. How much moral credit do we give billionaires in the culture in which we live? How about negative? We hate their guts. They're exploiters. They made a lot of money. But they helped billions of people. Yeah, but they made money doing it. They benefited from it. And therefore it doesn't count. Not morally. There's no statues outside of Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. There are no boulevards named after them. Right? The statues of Mother Teresa, she helped a few thousand. Not, bill, not hundreds of millions. But she didn't benefit from it. So she's a moral saint. And they seem to be enjoying it. And that can't be right. You can't be moral and have fun at the same time. We are taught. So I think our morality is in conflict with our economics. Our morality is saying you should sacrifice. And our economics say you should trade. Well, in a conflict between morality and economics, I think morality tends to win. Morality places the center of gravity on the other, on the group, and it takes it away from the individual who's supposed to be selfless with no self. So, one more thing to rethink, is I think we need to rethink our morality, which is hard, and I think this is why we lose, because it's really hard. It's hard for people, after hundreds of thousands of years of being taught and preach to that they should be selfless servants of fill in the blank. And now you tell them, no, you should trade, win win, it's good for you. Well, but that's not all. And again, consciously, people might say, no, no, that's not what our morality teaches us. But look at how we view billionaires. Not just because we don't understand the win win transactions of economics, but also because they have benefited from the fact that they have helped the world. Again, I think Rand's contribution here is underappreciated among those who advocate for free markets. She reframes the debate about morality. It's not about sacrifice. It's not about being selfless. Morality should be about making your life the best that it can be. Morality should be about living the best life you can, achieving your own happiness, not at other people's expense, but through creating win-win trade or relationships with other people. Morality should be about making the most of your life. It should be about you. you know, Aristotle's project in morality and ethics was to figure out the virtues and values that you as an individual should practice to achieve your demand, to achieve your flourishing, your happiness as an individual. 
Grant continues that. And indeed, morality should be the science. It should be a science that teaches us, teaches us as individuals, what leads to success in life and what leads to failure. Because we need help. We need guidance. It's hard to live. We need principles to guide our lives. And when we have bad principles, it leads to bad outcomes, including bad economics and bad politics. We need to rethink on all principles. And Rand, I think, is the best guide to doing that. We think on all principles in terms of our own individual well-being. A morality of rational, long-term self-interest. I think that's redundant because I think self-interest, by definition, is rational and long-term. It's a morality appropriate for individuals living on Earth. It's a morality that encourages us to think of the world in terms of trade. You don't want to lose, and you don't want other people to lose. You want to be a trader. You want to be a value creator. And you want to be free. Individuals who want to live for themselves don't want to be told what to do. And they recognize the fact that they will make mistakes, and they will fail sometimes. Big deal. Learn from your failure. You learn from your mistakes. No self-respecting individualist, moral individualist, wants paternalistic government on their shoulder telling what they can and cannot drink, what they can and cannot pay their employee, what they can and cannot produce, create, build. To me, this is at the core of the struggle. The core of the struggle is individual freedom. But we need to be able to justify individual freedom in terms of morality, in terms of ethics, in terms of its justice. The left is very good at dealing with morality. Very good at it. So is the religious right. right? Those two are very good at it. We are not. We are not. Think about AOC. You know AOC? Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. My favorite politician on the left. Because she's smart. So people say, Alexandria, how are you going to pay for this? You want a green, you know, new deal. How are you going to pay for it? And you know what she says? It's brilliant. She turns around to the interviewer and she says, if this is the right thing to do, if this is the moral thing to do, if this is good, then we'll find a way to pay for it. Uh -huh. <laughs> but that's absolutely right. She's absolutely right. If it's just, if this is what morality demands, then of course we should do it. And nobody says, no, no, you don't get it, Alexandria. What you're advocating for is evil. What you're advocating for is wrong. What you're advocating for is immoral. Forget the money. The money is irrelevant. What's really relevant is the fact that you are advocating for evil policies, for policies that violate individual rights, that violate the freedoms of individuals that live their lives as they see fit. Yeah, the money's not important. Look, you know, people in America, we talk about Medicare for all, socialized medicine. Ooh, that's evil, right? Because it costs so much. Yeah, but we're richer than Europeans and they have it. So why can't we have it? Right? It's not about the money. It's not about costs. It's about the sheer violation of individual choice. The sheer violation of the rights of doctors and nurses and patients to make choices about their own health care and about who who they you know how much they charge and how much and what kind of health care they do if you're a doctor. It's about the rights of producers and the rights of consumers. It's not about the money, it's not about costs. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but that's not the barrier, because hey, the Europeans do it. It's about morality, it's about what's right. It's damn evil to have socialized medicine. We can figure out the economics afterwards. But let's fight on a moral foundation. Let's fight for the rights of individuals to live their lives free so that they can make decisions about their own well-being, about what makes them happy, about guiding their lives based on their own reason, in pursuit of their own values without somebody dictating to them how to live, and without a morality underlying everything. It's all over the place. 
selflessness is somehow noble. You see your basketball, just watch your basketball. He was selfless because he passed the ball. Really? You mean he doesn't want to win? He passed the ball because he wants to win. Winning is a higher value than dribbling. But it's infected everywhere. Selflessness is good. Self-interest is bad. Why? You only have one life. You only have one life. This is it. I don't know. I guess some of you might believe in reincarnation. I don't. And it's way too risky because I might come back as a cockroach. So I, you know, I'd rather think of this life. What? This is it. Right? Live it. And demand the freedom to live it. That's where the battle is. Thank you. Questions? A couple of things. It, it, it seems as though what we have in the world a lot today is you know, battles between large-scale tribalism and small-scale tribalism. And secondly, how do we keep free trade agreements from becoming corrupted? You know, the United States Constitution was a free trade agreement, and now it's morphed into all these other things that it never should have been and was never intended to be. So, yeah, I agree with you about the tribalism. I haven't thought of it in terms of scale, but that's true. You've got certain people advocating for big tribes, for large tribes, and then people wanting to break up into their little tribes. I, I, you know, I was on, in Montenegro. I don't know if you know Montenegro. Montenegro is this little country in, in the Balkans, 400,000 people. And I said, why the hell do you have a country? <laughs> oh, because we're this tribe of Montenegrins that, you know, who cares? <laughs> Right, you share culture and a language with these other people. What difference does it make? I mean, no, no, no. We, you know, and, and that's the little tribe. And then there's a big tribe, the European Union. Right? And, and, and I see it in America. America's breaking up into little tribes now. And America, this is the difference between America and Europe. Which I think is, 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 is America is the anti-tribal country. America is the anti-collectivistic country. Europe is based on a division of nationalities based on ethnic <coughs> origins based on what tribe you belong to in the past. That's unfortunately, from the beginning of, you know, of, of nationhood, Europe is stuck to that. And, and if anything, sometimes they consolidate countries and then they pick them up. Like there was a Czechoslovakia, oh no, no. We're, we're, we're Czechs and they're, you know, Slovaks or whatever, right? Really? I mean, and this is worth conflict? Or this is worth more separation somehow? So you've got, you've got many tribes in Europe because Europe is fucked, the nation state was founded on the basis of ethnic origin. America was not founded on the basis of ethnic origin. In spite of the sin of, of slavery, America was founded on an idea. And an idea that individuals are equal before the law, as individuals. And therefore, America has always been welcoming, or at least historically, not, you know, with caveats, has been welcoming to people from all over the country, all over the world. And immigration has always been, uh, you know, viewed positively. Uh, yes, we went through a period where we hated the Chinese, we went through a period where we hated the Irish and the Jews, and we closed our borders, closed the borders in the 1920s, was it, uh, which were tragic effects, really tragic effects. But generally, America, because it built an idea, dissolved tribes. You came to a melting pot. The whole vision of a melting pot was the tribe went away. And you didn't join a new tribe. You became an individual. You got to live your life, your life as an individual. And the great tragedy is, and, and this is what scares me more than anything else right now, is that I always viewed that element in American society as sacred and elastic. And then, you know, statism and governments left, right, they come and go. But this idea of individualism was part of what it meant to be American. And it was deep rooted in the American spirit. And that's what I see dissipating and going away right now. But because of both left and right, I see it across the entire political spectrum. And it's, it's philosophical and it's deep now. And it's going to be very difficult to reverse this trend. And, I think that has global implications and has implications for everybody. If America loses that vision of what it means to be an individual and treat people as individuals, what happens to the rest of the world? 
Yeah, Tom. I'd like to ask your general thoughts about the complementarity between different kinds of arguments for freedom. So I presented a bit more of the, the, the data-driven, I've seen Chet better off, who presented the right of the individual to live her or his life. Uh, those are complementary, but they're different. Yeah. So let me read to you a statement from 1844, from Friedrich Engels, <laughs> yeah. the outline of the critique of political yeah. economy, which appeared in the same issue as Karl Marx's anti-Semitic diatribe on the Jewish question. The Jewish question. Are you taxed? Favorite Karl Marx essay. essay, you should all read it. Yeah. It's it, amazingly anti-Semitic. His fundamental attack on capitalism was it turned Christians into Jews. Yes. And it turned <laughs> Jews as money grubbing, and he says they worship money. He literally says Jews are selfish, therefore they are capitalists, they're money grubbing, and Christians are becoming Jews, and the solution to Jewish problem is to get rid of the Jews. But what he meant by that is not just the Jews. He meant by that get rid of capitalism and selfishness and, and individualism in totality. The Jews represented that for common. Well, here was, here was Engels, his buddy, yeah. attacking bourgeois liberalism, that's us, for being in favor of peace. Quote, you have reduced the number of wars to earn all the bigger profits in peace. When have you done anything out of pure humanity from consciousness of the futility of the opposition between the general and the individual interest? When have you been moral without being interested, without harboring at the back of your mind immoral, egotistical motives? So that's very strong support for your approach yep. to go to the question of it's okay, it's good to try to be interested. Yeah, to be interested in your life. Given that, what is the proper balance for someone wanting to advance freedom between the empirical arguments about the utility of freedom and the uplift and the wonderful benefits and the peace and then the more, um, I don't know, if I put almost psychological yeah. arguments that you have a right to pursue what is good for you. Where do, how would a good person balance those? Well, I would call those philosophical arguments, and I actually think we're missing some psychological arguments, because I think they're important psychological arguments, and why people with certain psychologies are more attracted to freedom than others, and, and, and how we can encourage psychological health, which is risk-taking and freedom, and so on. So I think you need all... So I think you need all the arguments, let's be clear. I think you need all of them. I don't think we're going to win if we just focus on one. And I think in a presentation... To a, to a new audience, if you will. I think it's good to combine them. So I always give, you know, a taste, right, of the empirical stuff, right? I love the graph, you know, the graph of, of the GDP going up. And then I focus on them all. I can understand somebody just primarily focusing on the empirical stuff, but I would urge you to see something about them all, to give it some more form. It's not just, the, you know, there's a morality to this idea that individuals are coming out of poverty, right? This is really, this is, here people now get an opportunity to live their lives as free individuals. This is amazing. So I think we need to do all of it. You know, and I think different, we're going to do it differently weighted, right? You're going to do more of the empirical, and some of them are, I'm going to do them all with, with some empirical. And then I'd love to see people do more psychological, because I think there is a psychological dimension. I'd like people to do, I mean, I think we have to attack this from every dimension. I don't, we don't have enough historians. Where are all the historians of, of, you know, I'm always looking for that really good book that, that gives a good, accurate description of what happened during the uh, Industrial Revolution. And there shouldn't be one book. There should be like, this is the most important century of all of human history, in my view, 19th century, in terms of, I mean, this is where we came out of the dark ages of, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, income and wealth and aid and wages, right? And yet, there are a few books, but there should be a whole, you know, there should be a library of books about all the different ways that due to the Industrial Revolution improved human life. So we need historians, and we need, we need economists, and we need philosophers, we need ethicists. I think that we underweight, as a group, we underweight the moral arguments, because we're uncomfortable with them. Because we don't always agree on the morality of it, right? I mean, some of us are coming from a religious perspective, and a religious perspective emphasizes a certain morality that I probably disagree with, right? And it's probably more similar in some respects 
to obviously come out than to Ayn Rand. But I, you know, I think, you know, I, I know some of you will disagree, but I think one of the great tragedies of the free market movement uh, in the 20th century was that people didn't take Rand more seriously. I think that'll be the tragedy if Mises, people of the stature of Mises and Hayek had taken her moral arguments seriously, we would be 50 years ahead of where we are today in terms of influencing the culture. I think one of the great tragedies is they didn't. And I think we will, we will live to regret it, but our kids and grandkids might live to regret it. The fact that we didn't take, she is a true genius when it comes to philosophy and she truly made some profound, profound discoveries and, and contributions to philosophy, particularly in morality and epistemology. And we focus on the politics. And we should be looking there, and I think it will enhance our defense of, of, of uh, freedom, which we, which we, most of us agree is a good thing. If we took those philosophical ideas seriously and used them more, so I would argue, use them more. Whatever we're doing, we're not doing enough philosophy. We're doing a lot of the other empirics. We need to give it more of that all. But you first need to agree with them all, frankly. You first need to believe it's true. Um, Thank you. Uh, excellent speech. And I totally agree that uh, businessmen are the people who made much more than anybody else to put people out of poverty. But still, business is broadly accepted as something dirty and the businessmen, they squeeze something out of society and there's this notion that they can give back and there, there's yeah. three magic words corporate social responsibility yeah. that that, this is their chance, this is their chance to pay back out after all the, all the damage they created, what's your take on it? Yeah, I mean, this is exactly the point, right? Instead of seeing businessmen as the producers of the great wealth we all benefit from, right? As, as Tom said, to make a billion, you have to create trillions of wealth. You literally have to create trillions of wealth. People have done the calculation of Bill Gates and stuff. It's trillions of, of, of dollars in wealth for all of us. For their 70 billion, which is the wealth of Bill Gates. You can't even imagine what the number would be for Amazon. Just think about Amazon has changed our lives, every one of our lives everywhere in the world, even to the extent that other companies, like in China, mimic Amazon. So they, get, they don't get it directly from Amazon, but they get it from the fact that somebody's mimicking their idea. So the fact that Jeff Bezos, pre-divorce, has $146 billion, quite a bit less after divorce, is peanuts. It's nothing as compared to the, the amount by which he's enhanced our lives. Right? But instead of that, and, and remember that, and that's, again, underestimating it. Just think of, think of the, the number of people he employed. Think of the, sub, sub, the, uh, the, the suppliers. Think of all the small businesses that sell through Amazon and now have a business because they have a distribution channel, which is Amazon. I mean, you can go on and on and on on the ripple effect of one business has on our entire world. It's changed the world in profound, positive ways. And yet, they squeeze society. Who the hell is society again? Where the people they squeeze? Yes, some mom and pop shops also close. Okay, but that's competition, right? That's the way the world works. You can't compete, you close. But even the people whose shops have closed, is life is better for having Amazon. Because they live in a relatively free society in which competition drives innovation and therefore their standard of living is rising. In every dimension, this is a good thing. And yet, they have to give back. And I, when I hear a businessman say this, I go, what the hell did you take? You've been giving your entire life. Yeah, you benefited from giving, but <laughs> that's good. That's not a bad thing. You've taken care of yourself. I, 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 once, attended, I once attended a uh, Lifetime Achievement Award luncheon for businessmen in, in Charleston, South Carolina. So no, no lefties in the room, right? These are all good conservatives and all businessmen who've made, who've achieved something in their life. And, and they, I think there were three or four recipients of the award and they read these long bios, right? These long biographies of who this person was and what they've done. They spent, in a 10 minute biography, they spent the first minute and a half on a business achievement and the next eight and a half million minutes on a community service and charity. 
And then I got up to speak. And I was furious. I said, I've got nothing against community service and charity. It's really nice. It's pleasant. It doesn't matter, though. That's not what makes you a good person. That's not what changes the world. What matters is what you produce. What matters is how you apply your energies, your thought, your life, and taking care of yourself and your family. And you did a magnificent job of that. You did such a good job of that that you helped everybody in your community. You employed people. You created value. You made the world a better place while helping yourself. And you feel guilty for that. So you don't do the charity and the community service because you love it, which I'm okay with if you love it. But you do it in order to reduce the guilt you feel for making all this money. But why do you feel the guilt? What, what's there to feel guilty about? Right, and you can see them all squirm in their seats. Right, they give me a standing ovation at the end, but they want comfortable. It's uncomfortable because it's true. It's exactly what's going on for them. And one of the examples I gave, if you take the United States in 1776, America in 1776 was a poor place. It was a third rate. I mean, the British didn't really fight. Right? They had bigger problems with France, Spain, or whatever. Right? And by 1776, this third rate colony, within 100 and yeah, certainly 40 years, by the breakout of World War I, was the richest economy in the world, the most powerful military, it turns out, in the world. Just an amazingly rich place. How did that happen? Because of charity and community service, right? Because Americans are charitable, so they built the economy on charity. No, it's because businessmen. It's because of all those robber barons. They built America. And how many statues do we have to Rockefeller, Canning, Carnegie, Mellon, J.P. Morgan, God forbid? No, he's a good guy. And on, in the business side, I'm not talking about his politics and his ultimate compromise, but his ultimate compromise is the same compromise he, he supported in the Federal Reserve. But his ultimate compromise was the same kind of compromise that Bill Gates made in lobbying. J.P. Morgan was brought in front of Congress and said, how dare you save the U.S. economy in 1907? How dare you as a private banker have so much power? How dare you have so much money? We're going to regulate you. We're going to control you. We're gonna, I mean, these are famous hearings that he participated in 1913. And his conclusion from that was, they're going to establish a, a central bank. They're going to screw me. I might as well participate. Maybe it's the wrong conclusion that we wouldn't have come to. But it's certainly understandable. And I don't blame him for it. I blame the politicians and the intellectuals for allowing it to happen. But those are the people who built America. Those are the heroes. It's not generals. It's not politicians. It's not Mother Teresa's. It's not charities. Carnegie's remember for giving his money away. Great. But what he did to the American steel industry, that is amazing. The railroads, the building of America, that's his real contribution. That's what he should be remembered for. So, you know, businessmen are heroes. When our culture starts perceiving businessmen as heroes, then we'll know we're on the right track. And partially I blame businessmen. Stop, if you're out there, stop feeling guilty, stop being proud, and start declaring your pride publicly. You'll take some heat for it, but it's worth it because there's nothing more than 100 John Allison's. I don't know if you know John Allison's, the CEO of BBT in the United States. People like that standing up and saying, No, I don't feel guilty. And I won't feel guilty. And you won't make me feel guilty. That will change the world. So in the beginning, he raised the question of how we can communicate individualism and liberty. I think you gave some good tips. Let me give you one tip in the form of a question. Have you ever heard of Professor Claire Graves' emergent cyclical levels of existence theory of human development? And I would argue it's not enough to know about individualism and libertarianism. We also have to understand value systems, change dynamics, paradigm shifts, so we can effectively communicate with people and meet people where they are. I, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. I think we need to, we need to learn. I, I mean, I'm not endorsing that particular one because I don't know anything about this. I don't want to be perceived endorsing it. But we need to understand the world. The more we understand the world, the more we understand people, the more we develop our communication skills and our ability to present these ideas in a context that is that people can, can understand, the better off we'll be. 
I, I worry about any kind of deterministic mechanistic mechanist kind of system because that sometimes can deter people from, from acting because, well, change will happen anyway, right? Because it's determined. Uh, I think it's up to us to change the world. It, it's not going to happen by itself, and we need to get better at it. And we need to become better communicators, but we need to be better in terms of the ideas. And again, I'll repeat that I think what is missing to a large extent from the free market movement is all the philosophical ideas, the moral ideas, the epistemological ideas, the psychological ideas that are necessary to support <coughs> free markets, to support individual freedom, uh, and, and all the rest that, that, that we believe in. So uh, let's just let's, let's get better at what we do. I mean, I'm not criticizing anybody in particular, right? I think I think we've got a group of amazing amazing uh, uh, fighters here, but we can all get better. And I think better means, in this case, getting deeper and getting to where, I mean, learn from Alexander Ocasio-Cortez. I would learn from him. Make it about these moral issues. Add on the empirical, because we, we don't want to devalue that. That's important. So that's an upside. Right? The other thing is, we're right, they're wrong. We have reality, truth, empirical evidence, the, econ the science of economics, and any other real science on our side. So we should win. So let's take advantage of all of it. And let's go beat the hell out of them. Thank you.